Welcome to the Transnational Summit 2018 and to this very special conversation between David Westbrook and Marwa Al Sabuni. David joins us from the University at Buffalo School of Law in New York, where he is Delcado Professor. His research engages with the political, economic, social, and ethical context of capitalism and finance. It crosses the boundaries of law, economics, finance, sociology, anthropology, cultural studies, and design. His books cover an incredible range of topics, from global capitalism and the corporation and financial markets to ethnography, and yes, country music. Welcome Marwa Al Sabuni. We are very, very fortunate to have with us architect, academic, and author Marwa Al Sabuni from Hems, Syria via Skype. Hems is located in the central western part of the country, approximately midway between Aleppo in the north and Damascus and Douma in the south. Douma, of course, is, has, is a place that has been in all of our hearts and minds and consciences uh, for this past week. Despite the destruction of large parts of the city, Marwa has remained in Hums with her husband and two children throughout the war. If you've read her book, The Battle for Home, published by Thames and Hudson in 2016, then you'll understand the sense of familiarity she gives her reader with the city and even with herself. Marwa's writing takes you by the hand and walks you through the majesty and destruction of Hums over decades. The war is ever present in her story, and yet her project is one of excavating deeper causes of societal destruction. Through her account, her readers wander through Hems hearing her wonderfully told histories of buildings and communities, and seeing her artful drawings. Along the way, she weaves history, architecture, society, and personal narrative together, and tells a story of how societies divide and destroy, and sometimes rebuild themselves from the inside. Thank you for being with us, David and Marwa. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Priya. Uh, Mara, it's wonderful to talk to you again. Uh, unfortunately, I'm really sad you can't be here. Um, we've had difficulties with visas and timing and so forth. Uh, but then again, the question of physical presence is very much at issue uh, in Syria and less dramatically elsewhere and through this summit. So Mara, to begin, would you tell us uh, the basic thesis of your book? Uh, and it's a wonderful book. I, I, I really can't recommend it highly enough. Um, but please, tell us the basic thesis of your book, and then we'll sort of start with that and build on. OK. First, let me say that thank you for having me. And uh, I'm glad even to be in this uh, communication presence that uh, uh, is, I'm not physically with you, but I'm very f grateful that we have the chance to, to have the conversation at such time. So the thesis of the book, uh, I think, I think that the, the title of the book is a, is a, is a good giveaway because it, it tackles uh, two main issues, which is the war that uh, manifested by the word uh, battle and home, which is the, the deep main theme that runs through the book from the beginning to the end, because uh, it, it, is, it is the story of a country and a story of its cities and, uh, and the story of my city, Homs, but it is as well uh, a more general way of looking at the environment and how uh, our surroundings can either create home, a place that we could belong to, uh, or, or, or a place that we feel alienated from and uh, become a place that could be easy in the fortunate case of uh, of Maria at the moment. And uh, it, 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 through, through exploring the, the, the theme of home and how to, be, how can, if it is uh, the, the role of architects and architecture to create a place for us that we can be able to belong to. And uh, this is the, the main uh, core uh, theme of the book as, uh, as I intend to, 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 to write it. Thank you. Uh, 
I, I want to focus on the sense of belonging, and so the, a lot of the questions that we're going to be talking about are going to think about belonging and that vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, modernity that is often alienating, disenfranchising. Uh, so much of your book is the story of a fall, uh, of the decline of Homs and other, Sy other Syrian cities. And you list a bunch of reasons, corruption, bad planning, migrations that left people stranded on the outskirts rather than integrated into the life of the city, and uh, to primitive understandings of architecture itself. But what I'd like to focus on here is that the fall is a fall from someplace good. And what you say about how Homs and other Syrian cities worked for their people before the war and before the decline before the war seems to me particularly important for us at this summit to thinking about the global contemporary. Uh, if I may simplify, and we've discussed this before, it seems to me that the essence of your uh, pro-city, your positive thinking as opposed to critical, and you explore this in different ways, is this notion of diversity within a frame. So I love this sentence from your book. Wise urbanism, especially in a country like Syria, must set out to overcome the pathologies that arise from tribal ways of thinking and to generate in their stead, this is the key, a sense of belonging to a place and being part of the community that has made its home there. Could you elaborate on that for us, please? Yeah. So, uh, like you said, David, uh, the, the, comp the book uh, tackles the issue from a comparison uh, way of, of looking at things. So, uh, I'm discussing the fall of the cities, as you, as you just mentioned. But uh, on the other hand, I'm, I'm, I'm comparing this on, on the background of the old cities, where I found certain examples that people were able to live for such a long time with, together and form communities and societies in a way that they were able to live in a harmonious and peaceful way for, for decades, if not centuries. And I've tra traced that uh, back to, to the colonial legacy that we had in Syria in the French mandate uh, times and how uh, the French mandate uh, began with uh, with unraveling the urban fabric that existed in those uh, in those old cores or the old cities as they were built, by uh, by uh, uh, making different components to to be uh, to be uh, placed in different places uh, uh, on um, rather than making it blended and weaved into the urban fabric that existed before, and through this decline. We continued even after the, uh, the independence. We we continued to to follow those procedures in urban planning, where uh, people, according to their class and origin, and uh, conf uh, religious confessions, to be uh, uh, placed in in in, uh, in different uh, compo uh, component as a as a different components of the city. And uh, I think that the main lessons that we could draw from the old course is the way that market as a place of negotiation and trade was uh, was a core was a core vein was a, was a commercial vein that people were able to to mingle and and do business and this is this is discussed in, in the book in details because it, it draws upon the sizes and the shapes of the property and the way that those those uh, places for people were built in in a certain way that allowed them to to be able to uh, live the sense of neighborliness as as it is, as it was very peacefully and, and beautifully lived. And the other one is uh, is the housing cluster which is built on, on uh, the courtyard uh, uh, unit. Uh, again, this, this is uh, discussed uh, in terms of urban planning and architectural uh, view. And uh, finally, uh, the, the, the nature and spiritual places that existed in those cities. So comparing this with the uh, monoculture mono uh, type of building that we had afterwards, and which was built uh, built upon uh, classifying people uh, according to to certain categories uh, proved to be very uh, 
very destructive in terms of uh, bringing people together or just leaving them to, to crumble as, as we have now. Thank you. Um, let me follow up on a part of what you said. Uh, central to your account and, uh, is, is this notion of trade as creating connections, sort of a small business view um, associated, at least in the United States and Canada, with Jane Jacobs, that brings calls to mind Jane Jacobs. Um, it strikes me as significant because often uh, when we worry about justice and especially inequality in a global frame, as Per alluded to at the beginning, um, the market strikes us as kind of at the core of the problem. And you're arguing that the market or certain kinds of markets might be at the core of a solution. So that strikes me as quite significant. So at its best, um, but maybe I should elaborate a little bit on certain kinds of markets, you also say um, that at its best economic life in the city when it was working was humanized by ethical frames provided by different religions in the plural. So moralities, you speak of ethical sophistication. And then I suppose in a third level, you talk about religions again in the plural expressed in the built environment, sometimes in the same building, but generally within the same neighborhood. So you could see the mosque from the church and the church from the mosque and both from the shop. Um, so we have this sort of notion of integration at both the level of the basic economy, what Arendt calls labor, um, but also at the level of the built economy. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Wow. So uh, let's begin with the example of Jane Jacobs that you've mentioned now. So I think uh, uh, something that could be uh, so slightly different from Jane Jacobs' uh, uh, approach is Jane Jacobs' approach is, uh, it focuses on the bottom-up uh, approach where people are uh, encouraged to have this organic way of living and having those small businesses flourishing on the basis of providing uh, kind of channels, uh, built, in ch built channels that allow them to, to have uh, a small business. For example, the property size. When you have a small shop, you would be able to, to rent this property for, for uh, an affordable uh, price. Rather, when you have a big property where you are just inviting people who could uh, open big businesses and have a certain amount of, of money or, or wealth to open in this area. Uh, the the difference with with Jane Jacobs approach that we had in the old city that we had both the bottom up and the top down approach because here's where uh, where religion comes as an author, uh, as an authority and a background authority so people were uh, uh, willingly in, uh, in a willing way um, uh, uh, accepting this religious authority from different religions in a way that dictated a social contract or a social code among them that allowed uh, a kind of order or, or law and order in, in their trade. Uh, this is where uh, I speak about uh, the, the morality and the, the ethics of trade that we have. So combining both the top down and the bottom up in a way that uh, kept the business going to to the certain to the, to the degree that we had no top down authority that uh, people were uh, in in a way um, uh, succumbed to 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 certain greeds for example or manipulated the, their environment in a way that they you you can see how the, certain people took the right over their neighbors and that's when uh, also the beginning of decline uh, happened. You write of the built environment reflecting a worldview, uh, what you in some places call morality, but certainly an experience of life lived, a way things that are felt and lived here and in some specific here, place. So this sense of being here in a specific way that sort of suffuses your book, you talk about your city as a, as in some ways a possible example, but also as, a, as, as one place, um, is at some philosophical odds with the high modernism associated with uh, Corbusier's uh, plan for Algiers, 
or the more recent fantasies of the architecture in, say, Dubai. So can you say something about what I actually think is perhaps the most significant part of your book for the purposes of the summit, maybe? Much of your book is significant. Um, this idea of being here, a kind of located contemporary, as opposed to in the cloud and the global modern. So I think the, the, the theme of accomplishment that I presented in the book is very relevant here because uh, people were uh, able uh, to, to, to contribute in local production in terms of creating something that can be seen around them. So even, uh, even in the built way, uh, they had places they, they could be proud of as part of their identity. So the city uh, um, at, the, at those prime times where, ha where certain places felt uh, part of, their, of your own existence, this is a place that you uh, accomplished. This is something that you can uh, relate as a collective accomplishment, something that you could feel, uh, uh, as I said, part of your own identity. And uh, this accomplishment was sustained by uh, by the local production. So you could see the traces of your own work uh, being uh, um, like threads that connect you to the place that you have as yours, as ours. So this is uh, comparing this with the with the uh, idioms of uh, modernism like Le Corbusier was uh, was suggesting and and as the 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 French mandate was uh, was imposing in our cities is uh, the idiom where something is imposed on your place something that doesn't relate uh, nor in uh, material or uh, uh, features or even scale or details, all of this is imposed and imported from somewhere else. And it doesn't have any features of, uh, of winning, for example. You, you, uh, I always say that, that you would cheer for the winning team. You want, nobody cheers for the losing team. So if, you're, if your environment, if your surrounding is something that you could pride and take pride in, it, it, you, you will sustain, you will, you will consider this as your ownership collective ownership. Uh, coming back to your notion of achievement here, collective ownership of something that, that you or, that, or that, that you collectively, that your community has worked for, um, it's easy to see a linkage between alien notions of the modern and colonialism. But can you say anything about the period after colonialism? Um, the alienation of the modern hardly stops with the withdrawal of the colonial power. Yeah. Well, here we have two cases. We have the case of the, the region where I, where I live, the, the place where the traces of coloni colonialism uh, didn't appear, didn't, didn't disappear, actually. We still have the mentality of uh, of uh, some kind of inferiority complex, some, something that the, the colonial uh, power left behind, that you are always should be dependent on this accomplishment of others. And you have no other counter accomplishment to belong to. So we always have this notion that if it's Western, it should be better. You know, we are not able to come with our own product with our own solution and uh, this relies in, in, in a significant part on the idea that we have during colonialism uh, so many means of local production were destroyed so for example in Homs it was it was a textile uh, city where much of the wealth of the city depended on textile production now we have no single textile production in the city so we depend on on importing textiles from outside. So this kind, of, this mentality of dependent uh, dependence and uh, following is still is still there in every region in this part of the world that had been af affected by colonialism. But on the other hand, you still have the the rest. It's a, a global issue. Uh, it's proving to be a global issue that the way our cities are. Uh, 
uh, being affected by by globalism and uh, and modernism and i think uh, the the look the, the the way our cities are being being designed now and built is uh, is being controlled by money so it's it's a different kind of uh, if you like colonialism but i mean you our cities are uh, are controlled by by wealth now, and buildings, and the uh, the, the position of buildings, the, the 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 urban planning, the look of buildings, all, all of that uh, depend on on developers and the companies that control the the, the building industry. I should I should probably say. <laughs> um, that the video feed is that way. So I have the strange experience of talking tomorrow while not looking at her. And then I turn around and I have the <laughs> to see her. <laughs> and I have the strange experience and I can't really talk to her because then it's backwards. So that's why I'm doing this. <laughs> it's that and you know, I'm afflicted. But at any rate, <laughs> um, anyway, it's not just nervousness um, at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so we're in a post, uh, much of this has happened, right? So whatever its use is critique, there is a question of, well, against the background of uh, going on a century now, since the French mandate, um, against, a, against this background, how does one reconfigure, move forward, right, without indulging or engaging in a sort of simple nostalgia, uh, which you start your book by saying, you know, there's no, I don't, I, I have no desire to go back, right, um, but you also at the same time clearly wish to learn from, uh, the, the tradition. So, so now, given years of the sorts of urban planning and architecture uh, and resultant ghettoization and balkanization and even war in Syria, uh, not, not elsewhere, elsewhere some of the same problems have not led to war but are nonetheless problematic, Paris. Um, so how does one begin to think about moving forward uh, in Syria and elsewhere? architecturally yeah so I will begin with with, with simple explanation why 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 I think that we still have the the dependence on uh, or, or the legacy of, uh, of colonialism that even after independence uh, the Syrian government called upon in the 60s called upon the same French architect who was designing the cities uh, during the French mandate to continue the, to plan the Syrian cities and implement the, the same plan that he had in, in the 20s to, uh, to implement in the 60s. So we still have this dependence, as I said, uh, on the Western, uh, Western expertise who, who knows it all and we, we don't have the, the, the knowledge to, to move forward. That's the, the, that's the main mentality that uh, is driving or, uh, or governing uh, our cities. So uh, the other model was the Dubai model or the Gulf model. For example, before the war, and part of uh, is, is partial, partially a reason why Homs was among the first cities which had revolted, that uh, we had a mayor who, who was obsessed with Dubai and wanted to raise the ground every single uh, uh, old structure that belonged to the Ottomans or the Ayyubid times and basically create uh, high rises and tower blocks all over the old city. So we still have this infatuation of, of the accomplishment. We are searching for accomplishment. That's, that's why I think you have either the looking back, the, the, the retrospect, people who uh, sees, uh, see the accomplishment uh, reside in those past periods of, of a golden era that uh, no longer exists now. And those who are uh, looking around for, uh, to, to import and to imitate uh, some kind of accomplishment that 
the, uh, it's not theirs, it's somebody else, like the Gulf or the Western model. So I think the way forward is to look at, uh, at um, assets, local assets that would, uh, would allow us to continue from, from a place of uh, a, worker, a workable place, a place that proved to be working, draw their lessons from that and continue moving forward, even in small steps. And it would be small steps because you are learning at this point. So uh, the first way forward, I think, is to abandon the idea of instant accomplishment. Uh, I, I'm sorry, abandon the idea of what? Instant, instant accomplishment. We mm. won't have an instant, an immediate result that, wow, this is an accomplishment. This is something, that, this is how our city should look. This is something great. We build something great. We should build something modest at the beginning and build upon and find our way of expression and find our way of growing instead of just, you know, injecting something that already had a fulfilled growth. Uh, yeah. You have an award-winning website um, that's garnered a lot of attention uh, in architectural circles. Uh, can you say something about how this plays into uh, creating a contemporary, um, yet in some sense, local idiom? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I won't claim that this, this you know, this kind of accomplishment to our uh, portal. But I, I, it's, it's, a, it's the idea of my husband. My husband is an architect as well, but he believes in the role of, uh, of media. And this website was uh, he he established this website in two thousand and nine. And uh, basically, the idea was behind this is that we don't have an Arabic content. We don't have an online Arabic content, and mainly architectural content. We don't have any architectural content. We don't have magazines. We don't have uh, journals. And surely, we don't have online content in, in, in the Arabic language, which was very, it still is uh, a challenge uh, to seek knowledge. So his main idea was to, to deliver this content as, a, as said, as part of small steps that you translate the, the, the English content where it's just, you know, the daily news, it's, it's a news portal, daily news of architecture. So you create the content for people to build upon, to, to know what's happening around. And that's why in one year it has won the, 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 the award of best media project in the Arabic world. Um, somewhat more generally, a lot of your work has been facilitated by the internet. Um, your contact with the English philosopher Roger Scruton, as I understand it, started over the internet. Um, so in some ways, global access helps. But on the other hand, coming back to our sense of architecture being elsewhere, our, our worries about that, does understanding architecture in terms of a global audience present difficulties? Uh, perhaps in finding a more specifically Syrian or Mediterranean idiom? Yeah, I mean, localism doesn't, doesn't mean, from my point of view, doesn't mean uh, closeness. On the contrary, you, in order to become, to, to be, to focus on localism, you have to be open, you have to learn from others, and this is how trade works. You, you you are open to others. You learn from others, and you uh, you create your own content. So uh, it doesn't mean that if you are looking for a way of self-expression that you discard every way of uh, other expressions. On the contrary, you, you should have uh, the access to to a global knowledge, to global uh, conversation like the one we are having now, and uh, in this way draw the lessons to create your own ways of expression and production. Thank you. Uh, please feel free to ignore as much of this question as you wish, uh, insofar as it raises political concerns. But what do you hope for, for Syria and Om specifically, from the international community? And you may think of the international community by, in terms of other nations, uh, of supranational organizations, or of international civil society, perhaps as represented here. Um, 
what much of your work is focused on what we in Syria should do, but what should those of us who are elsewhere be thinking about doing? Okay, um, I'll start with an example of, uh, of uh, the, the work, the current work, uh, or the current impact of international help uh, in Syria. The, the, the first uh, or the more, most evident one is, is the work of international organizations on the ground. And the other one is, of course, uh, weaponizing. And uh, I, I'm surely against weaponizing. I'm surely against uh, international interference. But uh, let's look at the way that our city is being impacted now by the work of international organizations who, do, who did a wonderful job at, at the beginning of the emergency. They helped a lot of people who were in a humanitarian need. But afterwards, it turned into, into channels for corruption as well and into channels of dependency. So people are no longer seeking their uh, um, local solutions to, to find ways out. So instead of having people working, you have people who are depending on aid. And instead of people seeking to, to change certain reality, they are still in the phase of waiting, that they, they will wait for the international help to come. They will wait for the international funds to come. And this is for me is very, is very risky because uh, again, you would have scenarios like in Kosovo, for example, or in Kabul, for example, where 20 years later, you still have no traces of, of reconciliation. You still have no, no, no traces of, uh, of uh, self uh, maintenance or self mending. You still have the, you, you have those uh, Saudi fund, funded mosques. You in Kosovo you have uh, the U.S. funded uh, bases in in Kabul, but you don't have any urban uh, or architectural building that is being built by people to to uh, of the place, creating mainly a place to call home. So this is my main uh, main uh, worry at the moment, that we will end up in a place, for example, like Beirut and Lebanon as well, a place of hotels and centers of international uh, institutions and organizations. And people are, the Lebanese are uh, everywhere on the globe immigrating uh, and just, you know, spending the summer in Lebanon. And you still have also all the seeds of civil war still uh, living and growing in such a place so what what else to to expect from international community i would I, personally I, I would like to see a more um, like trade again uh, uh, a conversation uh, in the area of exchanging knowledge so more than that it would be just creating dependency you don't want funds to be flooding into a place of corrupt and corruption and, and, and civil war because you will end up with, with, uh, with warlords being more empowered. I think uh, exchanging knowledge and uh, building upon, uh, upon this as a cornerstone is, is the best thing that you, you could hope for from an international community. In your critique of modernist planning in Syria, um, and to some extent, conversely, in your own designs for more humane public housing, you hold up traditional Syrian buildings and spaces as successful possibilities. Uh, but I'd like to ask a question sort of about process. Well, while it would be lovely to have a frame through which people live together peaceably, and perhaps these frames can serve as some sort of model or some sort of way for us to begin thinking can be instructive for us as we think about the 21st century. Um, I guess my question is, didn't some frames come together rather organically? So this maybe is going back a little bit to what you were saying about Contra Jane Jacobs, both top down and bottom up. Um, that is, to what can we say about the relationship between what anthropologists call emergence uh, and, and then rather more directed notion of design, um, both at present and maybe going forward. In other words, one of the demons, in a way, in the story is not just the corrupt bureaucrat, but also the overly proud architect, uh, the figure of 
for the figure of high modernity. So how do we sort of strike a balance between between society and the built environment emerging from the actions of lots of folk um, in trade and otherwise, and from things that are more planned, built, designed? Yeah. So uh, like you said, you have the authority, which is the authority of the city, the, gov the governor or the mayor, uh, who controls uh, part of the, uh, a, a significant part of taking the decision or making the decision. And uh, on the other hand, you have the architects who have uh, the, the, the planning expertise, the, the problem solving uh, capacity, and the public who, who also uh, have the capacity of building their own homes. Uh, so how you, the, the main question I think of, your, of, of the point you are raising, how to avoid creating slums? because slums are created, built uh, organically. Uh, so I think that getting the input, the public input, or getting the, the feedback, hearing the public, and uh, living among them uh, in a way to understand all the hidden cultures, because you, you get the, 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 the broad culture. You think you, you understood uh, uh, the local problems and the local aspirations, but inside each community, inside, inside each neighborhood, there are hidden cultures that you have to understand as a professional who would uh, provide solutions. And uh, once this established, the architects should be controlled in a way that their ego, like you mentioned, their ego should be uh, contained in a way. And uh, this ego could, cannot be contained uh, uh, without, uh, without um, uh, uh, the awareness of authority. So architects should be trapped basically between the public and the governor. What do you think the international community can learn from Syria? And here, I perhaps from Syria's unhappiness, but also from its successes, which was, for me, actually really the most important part of the book. Yeah. So I think from the un unhappiness is, is the, the major lesson is, uh, is do not take built, built environment uh, lightly. You should, uh, you should sense uh, uh, beforehand, how uh, how selling the city centers to uh, to the higher bidder is is a is is a very losing bet because when you push people to the periphery and corner them in a place that they don't care about anymore, you are you are risking that the you are risking having civil war no matter how developed your country is, or no, ma no matter how peaceful you think your country is. Because in Syria, we also had this uh, widespread notion that our country is an exception, that we, are, we have a, a, a cultured uh, society, we have high levels of education, we had, we had low level of uh, unemployment, and unemployment, we had zero deficit on our, uh, on, uh, uh, in on, in our country, so we had we we had the impression that we are we we are much a, an exception of a place to be destroyed this easily, but uh, unfortunately the circumstances uh, proved uh, otherwise, and uh, from uh, the successes of of the old model in Syria, I think that the more you create chances and channels for people to mingle and have the, have encounters that could, uh, uh, it, this would, would lead into more knowledge of the other. You, would, you won't have the, 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 the notion of the other. You, have, uh, you will create togetherness. And creating togetherness is, is in, in a very large part depend on letting go of greedness. So this is something that was built in our, in our, in our country, in our old cities that uh, greedness is not manifested in, in, in any way in those small alleyways, in those market uh, spaces, in those houses. So taking the lessons from there is, is, a, is a very, I think, wise uh, uh, measure to, to take. Uh, I, I thank you very much.
I think this has been a lovely conversation. And I, um, the more I began to engage your work, the more I began to think about how much it offers a way forward vis-a-vis -vis some of the familiar tropes of globalization or modernization and its discontents. Um, so I think what you've done here is really very um, significant, very original, uh, and can be very instructive. So I thank you, and I thank you for your time. It was lovely. I hope we talk again. I hope we talk yeah, again. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye.